Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. All right, hey everybody, welcome to episode 256 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. Brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. I'm your host, Anthony Renna, and the show notes are located at continuefit.com. It's where you'll find all my resources. All right, on the strengthcoach.com, Coach's Corner, I spoke to Coach Boyle about why spend time on a lift when you're not going to really go for strength, a thread about the NFL Combine, and another thread about low testosterone and his thoughts on it. For the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment, I'm on with Rachel Cosgrove to talk about avoiding the pitfalls of opening a gym. Great one from Rachel. For the Functional Movement System segment, Jenna Gourlay is back to start a two-part series on using the FMS with groups. For the Train Heroic Data-Driven Coaching segment, Tim Robinson is on with Adam Doughty to talk about what we can learn from CrossFit. Remember, check out trainheroic.com to start your free 14-day trial. Let them know Anthony sent you. You'll save 10% off your first year of the Train Heroic Pro or Elite Editions. All right, for the Body by Boyle online.com, hit the gym with the Strength Coach segment. I have on speed and running expert Derek Hansen. I spoke to him about long-term athletic development windows for speed, whether or not they're, we should be thinking about them. Uh, strength for speed, his thoughts on that. The treadmill versus ground running. The benefit of sprinting for uh, long distances, so learning that technique and how to, uh, he reverse engineers it, it's pretty cool. Um, Using hill sprints, are they any good? Uh, Be the hashtag, what that means and and using technology and uh, which technology we should use, the very limited amount of technology that he recommends. And we're gonna talk about his running mechanics professional certification, he's launching that in July uh, at Drive 495. Uh, So we talked all about that. Lots of things to get to. So let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the strengthcoach.com, Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. Strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength conditioning information. You could try it out for three days just to buck. You'll have access to all the articles, videos, and programs, as well as the best forum on the net. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day. We have lots of interesting conversations. So check that out at strengthcoach.com. Coach, how you doing? I'm doing great, Ian. How are you? Doing great. We're recording this on Friday. It won't come out till next week, but this weekend, I mean, we got to take advantage of this weekend. It's going to be gorgeous, unbelievable. I mean, perfect weather all weekend. Is that what they said? Really? They did. I hear it is. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. I don't know. I haven't. It's supposed to be nice yet, but I, it's actually it's funny. It's it looks like it's clouding up here right now, but that's this is Friday, so that's all right. And Plum Island, you got to get out there this weekend. <laughs> Absolutely, I am going to get out there. All right. Well, Mike, I want to I want to revisit this squat with heel boards because I I felt like Mike McKay he posted a um, he listened to the podcast and he and he posted a question and I kind of wanted you to expand a little bit more and you know I think what what I got out of the question was look you're stopping at one twenty so what's the point of even going there on a questionably dysfunctional pattern because like the squat really isn't part of your main lift you're doing trap bar deadlifts rear foot elevated slide board line single leg squats right slide marches so i guess he was saying like look 120 isn't you're not working on strength anyway so why even bother going there if you're really not working on strength and you're really going to just stop with the squatting at that point uh, why do you spend that much time on it if really you're not going to really uh, go for strength on that lift? Um, uh, one of my famous friends wrote this um, article about does your roast fit into the pan? <laughs> Remember that one? Yes. Yeah, so it's just one of those things. Like That's what I try to get across to him today in the uh, – I wrote in that forum thread – is it's really arbitrary and it's just, we always just say exhaust goblet position. And 
that really can be very variable. It might not be like for an adult, it's probably not 120. I'm not going to try to get some adult to pick up a 120 pound dumbbell and goblet squat it. Yeah, you know, what I mean? we might we might be done with goblet squat with adults at you know 24 kilo kettlebell, or we might be done at a 55 pound dumbbell. But I guess the the point, what I probably should have said is it never goes beyond the heaviest dumbbell, and. And the reality is with certain people, it may even go beyond the heaviest dumbbell. We might keep going to like 120 plus a vest or a couple of vests if we got somebody that's pretty strong. Because I just feel like I really do want to exhaust that pattern before I split to the unilateral pattern and say, okay, from here on in, it's unilateral squat. But it is that, you know, cutting the ends off the roast thing because the pan is only X amount of inches long. It, it's really, it's pretty darn arbitrary. And that's why I said, um, the other thing I said to Mike is, hey, you know, everybody can do it any way they want. It's just sort of the way that we do it. And the reality is it's the way that we do it in certain situations and in other situations. Exhausting goblet squat means when I look at you and think, boy, Anthony really battles to get that dumbbell in position. And that's more of what we're fighting with than it is the actual exercise. Then that's the time. The dysfunctional position thing I don't agree with because I said we use heel boards all the time and I'm not a problem. And I, and I don't think also I think we can get caught up in this no bilateral squatting thing. And this is coming from kind of from Mr. No bilateral squatting guy. But it's not like we don't want people to have strength in the squat pattern. What we don't want to see is sort of this this kind of stupidity of powerlifting that we get caught up in where we watch people and think – you know, I can't tell you the number of just terrible videos I've seen on Twitter in the last, you know, even whatever the last month of people squatting, kids, adults, everybody. And at some point you think this is really a bad idea. And I guess the question that you have in your mind is what's that point? You know what I mean? Where is it? And for us, that point, you know, whatever the tipping point, you go back to kind of the tipping point book, the tipping point seems to be when you run out of dumbbell to pick up, that's probably a pretty good spot to to say, okay, let's let's split it and let's go to split squat. The other thing that we found, and sorry, I know this is a really long answer to a short question, as I always do, but we went from goblet squat to split squat. And I always say with, I have my, uh, my middle school group. And one of the things that we realized was when we went away from goblet split squat, it didn't look as good. When we went to suitcase, for whatever reason, the, the kids weren't as good. And we're like, okay, we'll stay with goblet squat and goblet split squat a little bit longer and hopefully develop a little more of that kind of upper back um, anti-flexion strength that we need. Not even upper, I guess upper back, thoracic spine, lower back, every all that anti-flexion strength that I think you really get from goblet. The nice thing I love about goblet is that you are getting pulled into flexion so you're really developing those extensors. One of my big beefs with the back squat thing has been that with back squat, you're kind of balancing a load on your spine in extension. Whereas in goblet squat, you're holding a load in front of your sternum and you're in an anti-flexion mode. It's very similar in that way than to deadlift. It's almost like it's deadlift, but I've moved the load. So how's that? Yeah, it's good. I think I just made that in like a seven minute answer. <laughs> well, I actually have a kind of one last follow up though. Why wouldn't you exhaust it from, and I think this is more like what Mike was saying too, is like, like bringing back to the, going back to the heel lift. Like why wouldn't you exhaust it without the heel lift? So like, okay, they can go to 45 or 50 or 60 without the heel start, lift. Start without the heel lift. That's the difference. What's like that? for me, first moment I look at the squat, and I don't love the body position, the first thing I do is like, yeah, we'll body weight squat, you know, we'll press out squat, we'll do everything with heel lifts. So I, I never, like, I'm, I'm one of those, I don't, I feel like going away from the heel lift is just a mistake, and I think most people, if they would do it, would realize it. I think when you start to heel lift people, you look automatically and think, oh my God, that just looks better. Okay. And then I think it's one of those things that you never really go back. Yep. All right. But that's, you know, again, and that's like I told him, hey, people, you know, people like look at that. Some people say, oh, it's putting strength on dysfunction. Yeah, maybe a little bit. But again, it's like Gray's idea. You know, Gray didn't, that's not the Bible. You know, he didn't come walking down off the mountain with the tablet that said, don't put strength on top of dysfunction. 
And and the reality is we've been putting strength on dysfunction for, for as long as I can remember. I've said this over and over again. Every power lifter that I knew, or not every, of the vast majority of the power lifters that I knew squatted in some sort of heeled boot, work boot, something like that. All Olympic lifters have always lifted in a heeled shoe. Everybody has known for decades that you squat a little bit better from a torso position when you elevate your heels a little bit. All right, good enough. Everybody's got to find their comfort zone. Or I said everybody's got to find the size of their pot. You got to make sure you. There uh, you go. <laughs> um, you know, an article. Some people might go. Well, explain the article just briefly, just so that everybody. Basically, think- it was yeah the story of a little girl who at uh, you know at Easter and and you know asked her mother why she was making the ham in the pot. Why did they cut off the ends? of the um of the uh of the ham and so she said you know that's the way my mother did it and she's here so why don't you go ask your grandmother and she asked the grandmother and she said grandma why do you cut the ends off of the ham and she said you know that's the way my mother taught me to do it and then she's here great your great grand your great grandmother's here why don't you go ask her and she went up to her great grandmother and she said grandma why do you cut the ends off of the ham and she said well we only had one pot it was very small and the ham didn't fit in there so that's why they did it and the the the, the kids followed suit even though they had bigger pots and there was no need to cut it off so it's kind of that idea of like that's the way we've always done it right Exactly. So, Coach, I want to ask you about the combine. We don't really talk about the combine. You posted the results for the 2019 combine, and and there was some definitely some interesting uh, talk a little bit about it, about it on here with you guys and Brian Henson and and Casey Wheel. And I wanted to get your thoughts because you did say, I mean, like it's it re- kind of the combine partially reminds me of this idea of look, we don't back squat at Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning, but if you're going to a college that requires you to back squat, we're going to back squat you, right? So we're going to use, we're going to go and we're going to we're going to do the combine stuff, the exercises. We're going to try to get you good at com at the combine because that's what you know that's what you need to probably get into the maybe to get in the NFL. You want to have good numbers. What are your thoughts on the tests at the combine? You know, because you did say that combine numbers do matter. Um, I. I could probably we could probably do a whole podcast on the combine, but I think I'm not a fan of the combine test. I think the combine could be done much better. So if someone said to me, "Okay, you're going to redesign the NFL combine," I'd probably run a ten and a flying ten as opposed to a forty, so that there'd be zero injuries. No one would pull a hamstring. It'd be a lot easier to train for. I'd probably make the bench press some sort of a more relative strength test where guys had to use either 225 and or a percentage of their body weight so we could kind of see, you know, the guy who does 35 reps on the bench. Yeah, I mean, that guy's obviously strong, but we don't really know how strong he is at relative, let's say he weighs 330 pounds. Well, I'd much rather see, you know, with the bigger guys, how many times they can bench press their body weight than I would how many times they can bench press 225. So I, I think there's a lot of old conventional, much like the ham fitting in the pot thing, which seems to be a theme for today of this is the way we always have done it. There was probably a time when the, you know, a guy who could bench press 225 for 10 was considered, Hey, that guy's pretty strong. You know, the guy who could do it for 20 was Superman. And then guys started to train just specifically for that. And suddenly there were 28s and thirties and, and it really became, it's like a muscle endurance test as opposed to a, a strength test in a lot of situations. So I think there's a lot of that stuff. And even like we got rid of like, I feel like, you know, any of the agility stuff and, you know, if you look at what people are saying about agility, I can train anyone to do the L drill and the uh, 510 5 drill better than they've ever done it before. If you give me that guy and give me a month, I'll give you times that'll probably be in the top five by position because it really, they, they're very much pre-programmed tests that you can clearly manipulate. So I, I just think it's it's just a, a kind of a thing, but it's also, as I mentioned there, it is, you know, probably one of the the world's largest job interviews in terms of you've got these guys and they're going to go and meet all the influences. One of the things that we used to tell our athletes when I was doing a lot of combine training in the '90s was, 
you know, one that, hey, this is a job interview and you've got to put on a really good face when you're out there. And we tell our guys, you know, lots of things like coaching related things in terms of if you fall down during a drill, get right back up and finish. If, you know, whenever you meet anybody, make sure you look them in the eye, make sure you shake hands. We make sure our guys were in really good shape. We did a lot of conditioning going into the combine, even, even though there was no conditioning test because we didn't want guys to be dying during the positional workouts. There was, so there's lots of other little variables that are going to play into the combine that make it more than just these whatever five or six or seven tests. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's interesting. It's just one of those things that they haven't perfected. The good thing now when I was doing it, we really tricked some people, to be perfectly honest. I had some guys that got drafted really, really high and never – uh, were significant impact players in the NFL and I could list names, but it wouldn't be uh, uh, probably to those guys benefits to have them listed as such. But what's happened now is there's been more of that emphasis on, yes, you've got to have X measurables, but we also want to make sure that this guy is in fact, actually a really good football player. And I think that's where teams like the Patriots have done a really good job because they've shifted the focus a little bit in terms of, yeah, you know, we go to the combine, we meet the guys, we interview them, we want to talk to them, we, we, you know, we want to get a character read on them, we want to get a physical read, because really what you're getting probably is a character read on the guy, what kind of person is he? You're getting a physical read on the guy, what kind of athlete is he? But then the third part is you've got to get a football read on him in terms of what kind of football player is he? The, the Patriots, they talk about how extensive the interviews are, and they really want to know, does this guy, does he like football? Does he want to be a football player? Because that stuff matters. So, um, as I said, I'm not. Um, I think in some ways it's good. The worst one, the, the the hockey one, is worse than the football one in terms of the hockey one has become a ridiculous circus of you know repetitive tests, which is really silly. All right, um, Coach. I wanted to uh, bring up uh, Ray Tucker brought up. Um, Low testosterone, and I think it's something that's getting really, really uh, prevalent right now is uh, we're seeing more lectures on it, we're seeing people talk about it, we're seeing more commercials, and I heard John Berardi say something which I thought was brilliant when asked about what his thoughts on that were if somebody wanted it. And he said, well, I'm going to ask them about their lifestyle. Like, I want to ask them a few more questions, you know, because he said it just really comes down to your philosophy on life. He said he wants to accept the changes of getting older because, all you know, maybe he's not going to be as stronger, right? There's certain things that are going to happen with, the, you know, this these hormonal responses. But... Uh, there's other good things like he's going to be calmer. He's going to be more patient. I mean, he said a few of those things. I thought it was a great response to kind of like accept this aging process, that piece of it. And I wanted to see what your thoughts. I know you said, look, it's all in the standard strength training, better diet. Uh, if you want to mess with unless you want to mess with your hormones, you're going to age. Just, I wanted you to expand on your thoughts about this kind of this this idea about low testosterone, and you know we're seeing more and more of it. Well, I think a big part of it is, I think it's just an excuse for guys to go on drugs. To be to be honest, it's amazing. I have a I have a friend who trains in a normal commercial gym, and he's he said, you have no idea how many guys run the juice in my gym, and all of them are doing it or claiming they're doing it because they have low testosterone, and. And I think I'm with John. You know, you're supposed to age. This is what's supposed to happen. And the idea, you know, we've almost made it like it's like it's shameful that suddenly, you know, it's like you didn't pass your testosterone test. Like you're, you know, you've dropped below the manly level. And I have no idea. I've never had mine tested. I have no idea what mine is. I'm sure it's not high, but I'm not really worried about it. And I don't think it's, you know, I think if you're in a situation where you can still, I guess, not to be crude, but when you can perform sexually the way that you want to, and that you can, as John said, if you're, if you're living your life the way that you want to, I mean, you know, I think we've put way too much emphasis on this kind of, you know, look good naked kind of thing. And you look at some of these pictures Oh, this guy is, you know, 65 years old and he's ripped, you know, he's got veins in his stomach. And I'm like, Hey, great. You know, if you want to be on the juice when you're, 65 years old and have veins in your stomach and be spending two hours a day bodybuilding in the gym, more power to you. It's not on my list of things to do. And it's not on my list of things to worry about. I think it's, you know, it's okay to probably end up at some point with, uh, 
a little bit of dad bought itis and uh, go hang out and watch your kids and be normal. It, and I think that's part of this too, is kind of the Instagram generation. It's looking at it because it goes back to the training older clients thread. If you're somebody that as a kid could bench press 300 pounds and your expectation is you're going to bench press 300 pounds when you're 65, you're probably going to need some drugs. But if your expectation is, yeah, I could bench press 300 pounds when I was a kid. And now if I can, you know, put the 45s on and bang out 10 reps, I'm happy. Then you're good. And it goes, I could, you know, I could go around and around with all of the sort of the cliche stuff, but it's like the Ryan holiday book. Ego is the enemy, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, ego is the enemy when you, it's like me, you know, hair replacement. I need hair replacement. I need uh, Lasix. I need steroids i need uh i need a lot of there's a lot of things that i need right because my hair's falling out my eyes are bad my body's not what it used to be but you know are you going to spend and i probably actually i could use some plastic surgery i could use liposuction i'm um, just trying to think i mean i could make a list of areas of imperfection of myself that i'm going to go and medically try to change or i could just be like hey you know something I'm going to be 60 next year and I'm pretty healthy. I, I went to the doctor the other day and one of the things they said, well, you're not on any prescription medications. And that's a big deal. You know, when you're 60 years old and you're not on any prescription medications, that's a big deal. That's a pretty good health indicator. Yeah. Not, you know, not them looking at you and going, Oh, by the way, you know, you got, you got veins in your abs and uh, you know, you got 18 inch biceps. I, I think it, in all honesty, I look at it and think if that's your goal, I I don't know if I want to look at the rest of your life and figure out what else is going on. Yeah. And, you know, first of all, we can find out some more about your imperfections. We could have Cindy on the show. But um, yeah, also, I, yeah, you, then you probably she could come you, up with a list. Double that list. Um, but last time last week we had James Laval on, you know, author of The Blood Never Lies. And, and um, James does a great job with really making uh, a lot of like the blood work and the things that you want to find from the blood work. Um, and, you know, look, I'm 52 and, um, you know, I, I get the same reaction when I go to the doctor, like what, like they look at me cross-eyed, like, well, all right, what, what medications are you on? Like, I'm not on any, you know, I don't, I don't, I rarely even take Advil, you know, it's maybe for a hangover, but, um, but, uh, but yeah. Hey. Vitamin V. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's okay. just kind of like one of those things where I think, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing more and more of it, but, you know, you could you could do the natural stuff and, and you know, just stay healthy and, and yeah, keep I know, moving. And... I wish someone would come up with a real natural supplement that worked. You know, you look at, what's his name, the baseball player? They have that. Uh, oh, Frank Thomas. Yeah. There's a million of those things floating around, but I don't believe that any of them actually work. Yeah. And... And it's like with, you know, with James, the problem too with a lot of this stuff is what do you want to give up? Because if, if you start looking, you know, from a nutritional standpoint, from a diet standpoint, eventually, you know, sometimes you can look at this stuff and think, wow, this is really restrictive. I don't really want to be on a restrictive diet. Yeah. I want my diet to include beer. I want my diet to include ice cream. I would like my diet to include, um, you know, the occasional, they make really good muffin tops, just the tops up on Plum Island. I like my diet to include that. That's a good muffin place. Yeah, really. Oh, that's right. You've been there. That's true. I forgot. I brought them back for you that time when you stayed over. You got to come up this summer, by the way. But it's uh, I'll be um, there Sunday night. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things that you know. I guess it's just easy. To, it's easy to be dissatisfied, and I think it's just as easy to be satisfied. And to look at things and say, hey, you know something? I'm doing okay. I look at I look at things most days and think, hey, I'm doing okay. Uh, you know, do I want to – and, you know, will I go to the beach with my shirt off? Yes. Do I care? I always think I, – I just don't want anybody that uh, – any clients to see me. That's all. I always think I'd be bad for business. But beyond that, <laughs> I'm a fun guy to hang around with. There you go. Yeah, you know, it, it is true. I mean, it, this this idea about being satisfied, you know, and, and like I, I did a thing when I turned 50, I called it 50 for 50, where I tried to get down, you know, I'm going to work on 10% body fat. But what I did was I actually had a glass of wine every night on purpose. Like I wanted to be able to do it and not do two hour workouts. I wanted to see if this was possible. And I got down to like 13.2% body fat. And, you know, I looked pretty good. 
Uh, my wife actually thought I was a little, I lost a little too much weight, but, um, but if I got to 10, I don't think anybody else would have known it. You know what I mean? So it does it really doesn't matter like that. Like if you're at 13, especially, you know, I think the standard, the best, you know, 50 year olds are around 16%, you know, just, that's just the way it is. So, I mean, 13% was pretty good and that was kind of pushing it for me. So you're right. You have to decide what do you, you know, what do you want to give up? Well, the other thing, too, is like you said, you know, you don't know if anybody would have known. And then think about it. Would anyone have cared? <laughs> more importantly? I think that's the bigger thing yeah. is that like I don't have any friends in my life who are friends with me because of my abs. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're like, if, if Mike, you know, if Mike had better abs, uh, I'd be to have more friends. That's just that's not reality. And, and it, it's almost sad as i said you know it is it's the instagram facebook social media kind of thing that you know people everybody's looking at themselves and thinking i'm not enough i'm inadequate you know look at me and and maybe you know you might be in a situation i was actually just looking at that thread and tim karen was talking about you know you could be you know there could be problems related to the plastics and phytoestrogens you know you could have legitimate health issues or you could have the normal testosterone that you're supposed to have for a person your age. And as I said, as long as you're not in some sort of health crisis, I don't know if I'd worry about it too much. Yep. Yep. All right. Good All stuff. Right. Coach, we will let you go. Have a great Memorial Day weekend, and uh, we'll talk to you next time. All right, Ian. You too. Thank you. All right, right now, Perform Better, they have the Spend More, Save More sale going on. 10% off 50 or more, 15% off 100 or more, 20% off when you spend $150 or more. Lots of things uh, as well on sale, so you can double dip. Good stuff there. Don't forget, Perform Better is special financing. 0% interest for 36 months, no down payment, and no payment for six months. Check that out at performbetter.com because that's a, a pretty good deal. Also, summit season is here. This week starts in Orlando, and then we have Chicago, Long Beach, and Providence. I'm actually speaking at Providence, so if you're out there, if you're going to come out, make sure you say hi. You can check out performbetter.com for all their products and info on their educational seminars. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Functional Movement System segment. My name is Jenna Gourlay, and today I would like to start a two-part series about how to screen and intervene with a team or a large group using the case study of a Division I college volleyball team that I consulted with last season. Now, using this system with a group is not much different than using it with an individual, but it does expose some difficulties with screening to an even greater extent. And that's because when you go from one-on-one -on -one to this large group, the sheer numbers can sometimes feel overwhelming. That's why in this first part, I really want to talk talk about how to do the screen logistically, and then in the next segment, get into what we did to improve the scores of that volleyball team. Now, there are three main things to think about. The first is that if you're just starting out, start small. The coach that I consulted with, she was in charge of multiple teams, but she decided to start with the volleyball team and then gradually branch out to the other teams as she got more confident and she got more comfortable. Now, this volleyball team only had 15 athletes, so if you're in a sport like football, you might want to consider starting with a group of players, for example, like start with a lineman, before screening the entire team. If you're not sure who to start with, a really good question to ask is, what team or part of a team am I having the most difficulty with developing? For this coach, it was hands down the volleyball team that she wasn't really seeing much improvement in terms of their performance metrics, regardless of trying different programming. Starting small allows you to get used to the screening and intervening with large groups, but it also has this awesome cascade effect when it comes to buy-in. You know, athletes love to talk, especially if something works for them, they're going to tell others about it. So once this volleyball team started having success with the system, it wasn't long before other teams started asking about it. This is one of the things that I love about large group implementation, because you don't have to get buy-in from every single person. You just have to get results, and at that point, the buy-in is contagious. In a sense, you know, group screening is actually easier than one-on-one. -on -one. 
The next thing is to do the whole screen, especially if you want it to work. You know, the functional movement screen is part of a system and you need the entire screen in order for that to be effective. What we've seen work well is doing the whole screen, but going pattern by pattern, meaning that you screen everyone's squat and then you screen everyone's hurdle step and then you screen everyone's inline lunge and so on. The benefit to screening by pattern is that you get increased efficiency. You know, you're still gonna collect the whole screen, but you're able to minimize the time that you have to give directions, the time that it takes to change positions, and it's actually easier on the tester. For the volleyball team, the strength coach had athletes rotate through with groups of five during their training that day. So on the first circuit, she did everyone's squat and shoulder pattern as part of the rotation. On the next circuit, she did hurdle step and inline lunge, and on the last active straight leg raise, rotary stability and trunk stability push up So she easily got it within one training session and the athletes were just rotating through. However, if you do have help, then, you know, if you have a large sports medicine team, then each person can take a different pattern and you can just get the whole testing done by multiple people doing different patterns. Now, the last thing to look at is to look at the data and the data alone when it comes to forming your corrective approach. One of the things that I love about consulting is that I just get the numbers. I can't have any kind of personal agenda or personal bias because I don't know the team and therefore I can actually let the numbers just speak for themselves. With this coach and with so many other coaches and fitness professionals that I talk to, they immediately try to tell me why. You know, they um, tell me that the lunge is bad because their hips are tight, or I know I need to work on their squat because their vertical isn't good enough. They let all this information cloud their judgment and most of it really isn't relevant. It's kind of like a word problem where you get too caught up in the details that don't matter and you miss the problem that you wanna solve altogether. So regardless of if you're working with one person or you're working with a group of 200 people, the algorithm is gonna be the same. It's simple, we just tend to complicate it with all of our personal biases. So let's get back to this volleyball team of 15 collegiate females. The good news, none of the players reported pain on any of the patterns or the clearing tests. The athletes didn't have any kind of mobility problems. The majority of the team scored bilateral threes on shoulder mobility and active straight leg raise, and all of them had at least twos. When we look at rotary stability, however, only three athletes had symmetrical twos, with the rest demonstrating one or two one asymmetries. Only two athletes passed the push-up, and while over three-fourths passed the hurdle step and the inline lunge, only a one-fourth passed the squat. So then where do we go from here and how do we improve it? Well, that's what I want to talk about in the next segment when we dive into how we intervened and the surprising results we got when we followed the system. That's it for today. My name is Jenna Gorlay, and this has been a functional movement system segment. For more information, please check out functionalmovement.com and thanks for listening. All right, now it's time for the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. I'm here with Rachel Cosgrove. Rachel, thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me, Anthony. All right, we got um, Mike Connolly is a guy who owned a, a company called Rebel Strength and Conditioning. He wrote a great article about what social media isn't telling you about owning a gym. Although he must not listen to the Strength Coach Podcast. We've been talking about this stuff for a long time. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, he... You know, he got rid of his business, he sold it, and um, he, like, couldn't be happier. And he just felt like, look, when you own a business, it's easy to get it caught up in things you don't realize what's happening to yourself, like the bills and clients and marketing and social media, which we talked about a little bit in, in uh, the first episode, two episodes ago. You know, there's so many things, and, you know, you guys talk a lot about this really kind of designing not only designing your life, but designing, knowing ahead of time what you're, you know, what's going to happen. He, there's all these things and you have to do what you're good at. This is really like a setup for like why you should get some coaching before you open a business. But talk to us about this article really. And like Mike and Mike kind of, it seemed like Mike knew he already knew, like he was Mike, he was not a stupid guy. He knew what was good, what he needed to do. He just kind of loved coaching and uh, maybe didn't want to delegate some of those other roles so talk to us about maybe like your warning or what Mike could have done maybe to prevent this 
Yeah, I, I thought it was a great article. Um, uh, so thank you, Mike, for putting it out there. Because I think a lot of people don't think about, you know, all of the stuff that it does come with owning your own gym. It's, you know, this glamorous thing of like, oh, I love this. I love, and same with us. Like when we opened our gym, it was, you know, we love training people. We love, you know, um, you know, we, we're good at what we do. Like we can open a gym. Of course we'll be successful, right? And there's so much more to it. And I think um, that's, you know, when day one at our mentorship, when people come out for the two days to see Results Fitness and, you know, whether they're thinking about opening a gym or, you know, maybe they've just opened a gym. Um, you know, our first thing we talk about is this is a whole new skill set. Uh, you know, we're basically, you're basically changing careers, right? You're going from being a fitness professional to being a business owner. And if you're not okay with that, if you don't want to become a business owner, then this probably isn't the right move for you. You definitely want to, you know, take on that business owner role. And, um, you know, we our our whole, um, you know, manual that we have as part of our coaching group is called from trainer to business owner. And that's what it's all about is really shifting your mindset from a trainer to becoming a business owner and really learning the skill sets of what you need to learn. And he talked about that in there, that there was a lot of stuff, you know, numbers and money and, you know, paying the bills and, you know, all of this stuff that marketing, right? Like things that you don't think about until you get your place open, unfortunately, you know, for him. Um, and, you know, then you realize, oh my gosh, I have to learn all this stuff and I don't want to learn all this stuff. And uh, so if you don't either get somebody else who is good at that stuff, um, to partner with, or to, you know, to, to be your right hand person to take over that stuff, um, or learn it yourself, then, you know, you're going to struggle and you're not going to do well because, um, you absolutely have to become, you have to be ready to become a business owner. And, uh, you know, I think that's, that's like the, the biggest shift is just shifting from, you know, being that trainer to being that business owner. And that's, you know, something that with um, people that come to our mentorship, we, like you said, we talk about lifestyle design. So like, it's not just about, you know, like right now you're in the honeymoon stage of opening your gym and it's exciting. And, you know, of course in the beginning, everything's wonderful, but let's think down the road, let's think, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, where do you want to be? You know, do you want to own a gym? Is this something that is a part of your lifestyle? Um, you know, and really as soon as we can, we get our, trainers to where they're not coaching as much. You know, we want them like the max is 20 hours a week that they're on the floor coaching. Cause you cannot run a business and still be on the floor coaching your clients more than 20 hours. I mean, 20 is still a lot. Yeah. Yeah, um, a lot. but like you cannot be, you know, you can't, you can't do both. Um, and so I think most people don't realize that they think, you know, they're going to open their business. They're not going to have a boss anymore. They're going to have freedom. They can do what they want. They can, you know, make, they, you know, we all, do this math that we think is going to work of, well, all the money I was given to the gym, I was working at, I'm just going to keep, you know, but you don't realize you have like <laughs> all of these other things you have to pay for. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it seems glamorous, but, um, you know, really thinking ahead, thinking about that long-term plan. And like you said, get a coach, get like now, like when we first opened, there wasn't any, you know, coaches or mentorships or, um, you know, find somebody who's doing what you want to do and get, help. Like, don't do this alone. Absolutely. Don't do this alone because there's, you know, there's so many people who are having success and who are doing, you know, doing a great job and like, you know, joining a mastermind, joining a mentorship, you can be around other people to share ideas and share your challenges and, you know, get through it and be successful. And it is possible. Um, but it does take a shift from being a trainer to being a business owner. Yeah. And one of the things about Mike is like his self-awareness, like of knowing what he's good at. He's like the perfect candidate almost to have a really like you know like to have a good business because he knew what he wasn't good at and to have like you know hire out those people he had a lot of self-awareness but I like what he says you know it wasn't over bad customer service either because a lot of times people think you know you can fix everything with customer service and the thing is like he says you can never let up and and it's not about the customer service because look people move they lose jobs they get in relationships they there, there's a million other reasons it's nothing to do with you so you have to keep that foot on the gas pedal in order to keep growing. Absolutely. I mean, 19 years in, we still have to keep our foot on the gas pedal. You know, we still have to look for the next, what's going to work in marketing, right? Like, I mean, social media, like it's, you know, if you aren't in this for the long haul, like if this, you think this is a get rich quick, you know, <laughs> business, uh, it's not, you know, it's, it's definitely a long term. You're in it for the long term and there are, a, is a whole new, you know, a whole new skill set you're going to have to learn. Um, but it's exciting as you do start to learn that new skill set and you do start to realize that you do have control, you know, over, you know, building your business, changing changing lives, building a team, you know, creating a, a place that's bigger than you. Um, and that's the biggest thing is really, you know, figuring out your long-term vision of, do you want to create something that is bigger than you, right? That's the, cause that's what a, what a business is. It's got to become more than, you know, you training a few clients, right? It's got to become 
where it's, you know, you, you do build a team, you do build a bigger mission, a bit, you know, you are helping more people than you could help on your own. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, and, and one good thing too, is if you do this and you, you come out of it, you really can open up any other business that you want to. So if you wanted totally. to do something else, <laughs> You know, 80% of it's the same, so... Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that's, you know, most of what we study is other businesses. You know, yeah. it's not gym businesses. So once you know that business skill set, yeah, then you have the, you have a new skill set that you could use in any business that you want to, you know, you want to use it in, so... Absolutely. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll have a link to this article, what social media isn't telling you about owning a gym from Mike Connolly, and then underneath it, I'll put a link to coaching from uh, the Results Finish University. Yes. If you read this article you, and you don't want to get a coach uh something's wrong with you so rage thanks for yeah, doing so this come out to our mentorship that's yes let us help you don't do this on your own so there thanks you go. all right results fitness university.com too is where you can also check out to learn more about our mentorship Hey, this is Adam. This is Tim. Welcome to the Train Pro Data Driven Coaching Sites. Let's do it. So, uh, Tim and I were talking, and we realized because Tim talks to a lot of coaches who are just starting out with us. Sure do. That a lot of them see this feature we have called the leaderboard, mm -hmm. and they some of them get turned off and get weird about it. I'm like, oh, you guys are for CrossFit. That's it's, just, you know. it's exactly what they feel, right? And that's, like that's that's actually it's fair. That's probably where they yeah. recognize that term from. Yeah, that's something CrossFit does. But sure. you know, maybe we should talk about what CrossFit does well. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe I think we get on a train of bashing folks and ideas. Is when we can probably learn something from them. Right. In, the, I mean? in the strength conditioning world, CrossFit is kind of everybody's, you know, yeah. whipping boy. Like, sure. It's easy to talk trash about it. Yeah. But like, given their growth and like how they engage people and all, you know, right. they're doing something right. Absolutely. So maybe we can learn from that. Cause like, it's just like anything else. Is like, you know, just take you know, strength conditioning. We use weightlifting derivatives a lot of yeah. times. Bodybuilding right? derivatives. You know, yeah. bodybuilding stuff. Like, yeah. we pull good stuff in different places to make a good system. And like, CrossFit sure. might not be any different. Yeah. So let's talk about a couple of things that CrossFit does well. And like that, um, you know, one thing they've got is that culture, Tim. Yeah, absolutely. And you you look at this culture, and you have these people who show up every day to the box, right? And they push themselves to the absolute limit, and you know they love it, and they cherish those moments. And they, you know, guess what? They're beat down, but they come back the next day. Right. And that's something that you know we could learn through you know those business models, through CF boxes, through things like that. How to develop a culture of of effort like that, right? Of, 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 of knowing that you're going to get beat down, but coming back anyway, you know right. what I mean? I mean, so, you know, especially when somebody's starting out, right? Yeah. Like they come into a place like that and it's not like they're training twice a week, you know, cause like think about like traditional, like, like personal training, take sure. the opposite extreme where like, I can really only afford to come and pay enough money to be with you twice a week. Yeah. Right. How hard is it to form habits with people? When you don't see them, you know, we see them fairly sparsely, right? right? It's a lot easier when you have these early frequent touch points. Totally. And they really become part of your culture and your community and they build habits. Yeah. Right? And you hit the word on the head there, community. And community is is based off of the constant and 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 um, helpful communication, you know, and they do that really well. And we actually have a lot of stuff in the app, right, Trend Heroic, that supports your ability to communicate and reach out and, and create kind of touch points for you and your athlete. And that's something that, you know, as sport performance coaches we can take that from crossfit you know and say hey man maybe I, we need to get at these folks every day whether i know you have some experience with your personal training putting things on calendars and stuff yeah so like in train road for example you know because i have some athletes from coaching remotely um which to be honest is, is actually a totally different role than in-person coaching sure there, there's like some nuance there that you have to learn and yeah uh, one thing i found is that you know even if somebody's on only like a three time a week program for example sure um it might it pays to have stuff in there on most days yeah so like they they get this habit of interacting with you with the app or whatever, you know, it's not any train heroic, but you know, it definitely helps them to be there frequently, building a habit and keeping those touch points high. So, you know, even in their, their quote unquote off days, right? Right. There, there's like recovery work. There might be some light conditioning, corrective stuff. Sure. Um, you know, maybe diet reminders. I don't know. There's a lot of stuff right. you can do that just kind of like reinforces you as a this helpful entity, this coach. You know, it's kind of in building this relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Great cultural aspect there to your coaching. And I think the other part of this thing too, Adam, is the competitive spirit, right? Or their competitive nature in CrossFit. A lot of people tune into the games and they see these folks going, you know, 100% in these ridiculous competitions that look so hard. But what people don't see behind the scenes, the scenes often is that these folks are competing every single day. There's a wad every single day. They're pushing themselves. And that competitive spirit and the way they kind of set up these competitions outside of the games, 
I actually do have some application in sport, right? Sure. I apply leaderboard events to not only our testing days, right? So bench, squat, cleans, to see where we're at. The kids can see where they rank among their peers, but also um, in, lit in things that are auxiliary or accessory work, things like push-ups, pull-ups, uh, free hangs from a, from a parallel bar, you know what I mean? These things that I know I'm gonna have some big, big athletes that can win, I'm gonna have some events where some small athletes can win, but I know that people think that in order to learn to win, you have to learn to lose. That's a quote I really, really like, but you also have to learn how to win. It's habitual. So we want to give that, that, you know, that sense to those kids a couple times a week in the off season and they get it every day in the in season too. Yeah. And like, so when we talk about like a product, you know, product has features. Sure. And in training rope, we have the feature of a leaderboard. Yeah. Well, features aren't just things. They're meant to solve a problem. Totally. And in this case, the problem is, you know, either remote or in person, the idea is, is like, is, is how do you drive engagement and get, yeah. get people invested in performing well in training. Right. Um, and so how would you, just shortly, how would you implement leaderboard in something like a really sub-maximal program? There's not a lot of testing. There's not a lot of maxing out. Yeah, well, you got to find something that's, that's fun, that's that's engaging the kids, something that they can repeat those type of movements in their primary lifts. They're still getting something out of it. But again, be creative. Make sure all your folks get a chance to win and lose. Cool. That's going to do it for us today. Go to trainherlick.com to start your 14-day free trial. And when you're talking with our representatives, tell them the Strength Coach Podcast sent you for 10% off a year of the Pro or Elite Edition. All right, now it's time for the Body by Boyle Online.com. Hit the gym with the Train Coach segment. Become an insider to Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning with staff meetings and services and complete access to the Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning programs. All right, today I have on Derek Hansen. Derek's obviously been on before. We talk a lot about speed. He's an international sports performance consultant working with athletes of all ages and abilities in speed, strength, and power sports since 1988. He's part of my upcoming book in August. Uh, his web Websites are sprintcoach.com and his new one, runningmechanics.com. He's got a new certification out called the Running Mechanics Professional. Um, and I want to go over uh, some of the things within that certification. And we'll talk about some other things before we get to that. So, Derek, thanks for doing this. Oh, anytime, Anthony. It's always great to, to talk with you and just even just talking off mic, we always have some great stories to share. So. I, I know. I was like, man, I got to get this thing going because I, I start to – to talk too much and we, we end up talking for 15 <laughs> minutes. I'm like, I should have recorded that. But, um, so, you know, one of the reasons, two of the reasons I wanted to get you on, I, I, number one is since I had on, you know, coach Boyle has changed a lot of what he's been, his ideas about speed since, you know, kind of quote unquote, finding Tony Holler. And then we had do Dr. Ken Clark on and it's kind of gotten me, uh, to, to, you know, kind of rehash some of these different topics. And I wanted to get you on to kind of go over some of the, the, the questions that I had, um, or, or you get your opinions on some of these things. Sure. So, um, and then also seeing that you had the, uh, the running mechanics professional, uh, certification now, I thought that was, uh, interesting. And I, and I think, uh, uh, I think it's needed. And, and I think there, there's this idea of, um, you know, that, that really, we can, we almost can just, we don't have that much, like not, running is supposed to be so natural. And once we get them to kind of, you know, nose to pockets and, you know, and get a few of these things in, we're going to be fine because, uh, you know, we're not, we're not working, we're not working with, for the most part, long distance athletes. And, and so, uh, or, or we're not in track and field. So I wanted to, I, I, I'm really interested in finding more about the certification, but I do want to talk first about some of the other things in speed first before we get to that. So um, I wanted to get your ideas on um, long-term athletic development windows for speed because just kind of looking at this and seeing more and more people kind of get into uh, this idea of like we can definitely get people faster. Um, and but, but there's this idea with the long-term athletic development uh, windows that, you know, if anybody doesn't know, like there's these certain windows when let's say you're, you know, boys and girls are different, but you know, let's say six to nine is the first window. And then maybe 12 to 15 is the second window. Um, I'm butchering that a little bit, but if you miss kind of those windows, you're missing out on a big opportunity for, for being ever being fast. Can you talk to us about your opinions on that and what you've seen? Uh, yeah, because uh, I think it's relevant for me, one, because I've worked with all these different age groups over whatever, 30 years, but also I have 
children that are now in those age groups. I have a six-year-old, I have a 12-year-old, and I have a 14-year-old. So, <laughs> you know, I'm trying not to get anxious and, and obsessive about like, oh, we have to do this now because, you know, as a parent, you know, you don't want to be that parent that's going to go like, oh, okay, I, we, we have to do this type of training and have to prepare them so that they can get a scholarship and, you know, I don't have to worry about them, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's complicated in that, yes, you want to get some of these things done. And we always, we always see these debates over multilateral development versus early specialization. And my answer to that, to some degree is yes. Um, you, you kind of have to do a bit of that, uh, of both of those things. So you have to expose them to a lot of different things and hopefully it's, it's a fun experience for them. But at the same time, you have to give them some skill sets early on so that one, you know, they, they have these physiological or neurological windows of development where they acquire skills. And then the other brutal fact is that they have to be good enough at their sport to kind of keep moving up in their sport. So if you have a child who's in, like, I don't, I'm not an ice hockey guy, but I assume that you have to have a child that can skate and handle the puck. Otherwise they're not going to move to the next level. They're not going to get picked. And, and there's all these bizarre politics around it too. So on some level, the windows of development are more political and social than they are physiological. So make sure you have these skills so that you can be part of this stream of development, you know, that other people are running. But the other part of it is, you know, are they like, if we talk about speed, I just want to make sure the kids are doing something fast, whether it's involved in their play, whether it's structured, because again, even, you know, since I was a kid, a lot of the running is associated with work capacity and, you know, mm -hmm. oh, what are we going to do for phys ed? Well, let's get them to run around the, the school or, you know, do a, an endurance test. It's very rarely do you see the elementary school, you know, teacher out there doing like 40 yard dashes with the kids. So, um, you know, those are kind of the forces that you're battling with is just make sure some of it is in there. And I, I, I'm not going to say how much, but if it's there, then you'll probably get better at it. If it's not there, well, then you're probably going to be behind. Um, and I think to some degree, like you don't want to be rushed. It's kind of like, you know, it, it's always a good time to quit smoking because the sooner you do it, you know, the better off you are. But, you know, even if you wait a bit, you probably should quit, you know, now. Or So I, I think you have to look at it a little holistically and say, okay, well, what are all the variables I'm dealing with? Are we doing, you know, some fast running once or twice a week in some capacity, whether it's playing or practicing or whether it's actually going to the track and working on these things? So it's it's tough. I, I'm not going to say like <clears throat> you have to do this much this time, but I I mean, as you know, it's it's a pretty complex arrangement of variables that you're dealing with. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think you know, uh, you know, obviously the debate goes on and there's been some not controversy, but maybe uh, some adjustments to the long term athletic development kind of ideas. And some people have some thoughts on that. And I, so that's good. I just wanted to get your right. Your right. Especially yeah, it, as a parent, too. Yeah, it's hard because it, you, you ha you're you're a bit biased. Like if you are a parent, then you want to you want to obviously you want to see your kid do all these things like with our kids we have priorities like, okay, you have to do well in school. Yeah. Academically that has to be sorted out. I don't need you getting straight A's, but you know, kind of be in the ballpark of the upper end of the class. <laughs> and then let's, you know, we want you to do some music. So pick a musical instrument, let's develop that. And then we want to make sure you have a good network of friends and then sports is in there too. So, you know, I, th you know, I think my wife and I are, she's, she also teaches physical education and she's a teacher. So we have this sort of 360 degree view of everything that we're trying to control and it's still stressful. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And you know, De uh, Devin McConnell had just wrote an article for the site called don't put your cart before the horsepower. Um, and basically talking about this idea of, um, you know, look, if you want to have, you know, work on speed with an implement, you're gonna, you're not gonna get the full uh, adaptation for speed because you'll never go as fast as you can. So 
um, you really, you really, he also, he wrote the idea that speeder conditioning work should only ever be done with a puck on your stick or, you know, a soccer ball, right? Or, you know, in a, with a tennis rack. Doesn't make any sense that you realize that 95% of the game is played away from the, yes. you know, the implement. What are your thoughts on that? Because I know you, you had a son who played soccer, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, again, my experience with my kids is pretty interesting because, you know, I was relatively fast as a kid and <clears throat> probably one of the faster kids in the city. So, and then my father was fast, right? So we have this sort of genetic thing going on where if I put my mm -hmm. kid in a sport, it's pretty much guaranteed he's going to be one of the faster kids. So do I need to work on it? Yeah, you know, that, 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 that's the easy part for me. Whereas maybe if your kid, I get a lot of parents calling me and they, Oh, my, my son is very good at soccer, hockey or whatever, but they're a little slow off the mark. And I said, well, were you slow off the mark? You know, as a, you know, when you were a kid. <laughs> and, uh, you know, inevitably that's the case, right? So that's, that's a difficulty, the, the genetics part, but I would say we did this I, I was using the curved treadmill and we can talk a bit about that later. And I put a, 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 a collegiate sprinter on there uh, who had very good form. And then I put uh, like a 15 year old female soccer player on it. And then we filmed them. And then I showed, I put them side by side uh, split screen and put it on Twitter. And I, I drew these sort of ellipses or circles around their running mechanics, their lower body running mechanics. And you could see that the sprinter was more front side and, and, and getting more height on his stride and putting more force on the ground. And then the soccer player was lower to the ground. And I said, look, this is something that we have to work on with her in terms of force production, put it on there. I think it got like 150,000 views and all the soccer people were saying, well, she needs to be lower to the ground because that's how soccer players run so that they can play the ball. And even her father's telling me, like, listen, she doesn't handle the ball, like, what, maybe a minute a game in total or a minute and a half out of 90 minutes. So we want her to be better for getting open and, and defending and, and running, you know, get, you know, just getting into these longer sprints. And, and so he recognized that. But all these apparent soccer experts online, you know, think that you're controlling the ball the entire bloody game. So it, it is interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, especially with soccer, because they have those, those you know, you have that pass where you could just throw it way ahead. And if she can outrun that yeah. defender while being on sides, right, that's a big, that's a big uh, plus. Yeah, and I, I think people overlook that. They, they're they always, when you, I mean, I guess it's like all of us, when we watch sports, we're watching the person with the ball. It's not like, unless you're very, very specialized when you're watching football, you're watching the quarterback until he releases the ball. Whereas I'm sure some real, you know, receiver aficionados or linemen are watching their position during the game, right? But the average person is watching where the ball is. Yeah, absolutely. I want to segue that into a question about, there's two segues here. One's going to be treadmill versus ground running. But before I get to that, I want to get your opinion again on uh, strength for speed because uh, you know, Coach Boyle's actually changed his mind on how important, you know, being strong is uh, for or how much time we need to spend in the weight room specifically for speed. And, uh, you know, you brought up this idea about this comparison with the 15 year old and then, you know, the, the other sprinter, like, let's say a male, an older sprinter. Right. If Greg always used to talk about this with golf a lot, he used to say, look, I understand, you know, the need that, you know, that people like will resist some of the strength training and, and you know, understand the importance of technique. But what I'm trying to say is if you ha take two people, if you took uh, a 15 year old female and a 25 year old male and you compared them and, and, and the, the 25 year old male will obviously be a lot stronger and you compared them, if you gave them the exact same swing as per the kinematic sequence and, you know, looking at the graphs and looking at the 3D kinematic sequence and they have the exact same swing, the stronger person is going to hit it farther. Do we, is that going to be the same thing? I would, I'm, I'm assuming it is for, for speed. I mean, if I had somebody with the same exact mechanics, which pretty much is going to be hard to find, but same exact mechanics. This, I would assume the stronger one is going to win that race. Talk to us about your philosophy on strength for speed. Um, yeah, that's a difficult conversation because it really depends on how you define strength. And I don't think that's that's a lot of the problem around it right now is that people think strength is weightlifting. 
Um, and that's, that's certainly a portion of it, or that's certainly a way that you can arrive at that, that quality. But, you know, there's a lot of things you can do with running that will improve strength. And uh, I've seen it before where we've taken people away from the weights and we've worked on sprinting or some hill sprinting and, and bounding or plyometrics. And then we stick them back in the weight room and they're stronger. So yes, strength is important, but I think people get caught up in how do you achieve that strength? But what you're saying, I think, you know, for the most part holds true. We're always looking to make people stronger. It's just, how do we get there? And I, I think the average strength coach is always going to think of of the weight room when it comes to achieving strength and, and that being the end goal where I would say like, Hey, and, and that's, you know, we'll get into the certification, but that's where I, I kind of turn things upside down and say, you know, uh, if I can make somebody accelerate better, if I can make them a little more explosive off the line by adjusting technique and throwing some running drills at them, is that not as valuable, if not more, like, wouldn't you want to achieve your strength gains doing the things that are happening on the court or on the field? So, and it's just, even from, a uh, just an economy of, of, of time and making sure that things um, are done efficiently in a time efficient manner, I would always want it to happen on the field and movement based. Whereas, you know, taking somebody and putting them through a squat program or a step up program to get them faster just doesn't make sense to me. Um, although, yes, I would do some of those things. But like, as Charlie Francis always said, like weight training is a general thing. It's a general quality and you're trying to achieve sort of a general level of strength so that it can be applied to what you do on the field or the track. And I just think right now the thinking is a little backwards because people haven't had the same education that that I've had. And I think, you know, those are some of the questions I want to get into with the certification is, hey, here are some alternative solutions for you. I suggest you try some of these things and maybe it'll change the way that you, you structure your weight training and your strength training. And maybe you don't have to spend as much time in the weight room. Absolutely. And I think I love that saying, you know, uh, you know, give somebody a hammer and everything looks like a nail. Right. And, you know, I'm sure if we went to Usain Bolt and started saying, we got to do this program, we'd probably hurt his performance. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, that's the thing, everybody, you know, it depends on what you're good at, and you'll always gravitate towards that. So if you're a great Olympic lifting coach, then certainly a lot of the answer that you're going to come up with is related to clean snatches, jerks, whatever. And there's nothing wrong with that. There are some cases where that can work really well. But, um, you know, even in my work, like say in the NFL, and when you go to meet with teams and you see players in the weight room, I would say the majority of the great skill players are not doing anything spectacular in the weight room. Um, you know, maybe there's certain positions that, you know, like linebacker, uh, you know, defensive line, I wouldn't even say offensive line, cause there's a huge skill component there, but certain positions lend itself to the weightlifting piece, just based on the positions they have to get into and the distances they have to run. Whereas if you have somebody who's a wide receiver um, or a defensive back who has to be very agile and have different qualities, uh, you know, in those different speed bands, they're probably not going to be a great weightlifter. I mean, that's just what I've seen. I'm not, you know, I'm not judging here. I'm just saying like, this is what I see when I, when I visit teams. So. Um, You also mentioned the curve treadmill and uh, there's been a recent um, uh, Twitter thread and, and I know he tagged you in it, uh, I think, Dr. Wayland. Um, and uh, it's this idea about treadmill versus ground running. And I know we get that question a lot. We see a lot of people, uh, you know, wonder, you know, can you achieve the same uh, uh, level of performance on the two, right? And, and you know, I think Dr. Wayland said basic physics, kinema- uh, kinetic and performances data all indicate there's little or no difference um, what have you seen and, uh, with, with this and, and, you know, do we need the curve? Can we have it on a regular treadmill? Uh, is that going to be even worse? Um, talk to us about your ideas on treadmill versus ground running. Yeah, I would say, um, if you took, you know, decent runners and you put them on treadmills, they would probably exhibit, you know, pretty positive qualities. And I think the main reason behind a lot of this is, is Cl- Ken Clark and, and Peter Wayne of, of, 
have said is that a lot of it has to do with vertical force and ground reaction force. So if we just look at the vertical component in a treadmill, that's really all you're working on because if it's a motorized treadmill, then the belt is moving, right? You set like, hey, let's go 10 miles per hour, 12 miles per hour, 20, whatever, and then you just follow it. You're not you're not necessarily putting horizontal force into that. You're you're putting vertical force into it, and then the leg recovers, and you land again, and you just repeat, right? So if you have good elasticity and good stiffness, you'll probably do okay on a motorized treadmill. The curved treadmill is a little different, but it's going to be kind of the same thing. The way that you achieve velocity on the curved treadmill is you try to move up the curve, you move forward, and when you put force down, it sends it the belt down the uh, down the curve, right downwards. So if you can put more force down into the ground, you'll pop up and you'll stay at the front of the curve. Uh, whereas if you're not putting a lot of force into the curve treadmill, you hit the the belt and it sends you back, and then it you know kind of slides you backwards. So in both cases, if you have good elasticity, good stiffness. Um, you're probably going to fare quite well as you would on regular ground. So I think what ends up happening is that good sprinters tend to be very good at producing vertical force. And you, you get into these debates of horizontal versus vertical. And, you know, I, I mean, I've seen it 99% of the time is you have to have that vertical stiffness component in place. Um, and the horizontal piece, all you do is you just kind of tilt yourself over and you just apply force in line with your body again. It's just you're tilted over when you accelerate. So, you know, we could, you know, argue vertical, horizontal, but you're just putting force down, you know, along the plane of your body. So I think, you know, if you're using those treadmills, it's interesting because you can duplicate what happens in real running over ground. The problem is that there are some missing pieces in there. If you have a motorized treadmill, and I've never really liked motorized treadmills because I know, you know, from the science that there's stride variability or, or ground contact variability, like even Usain Bolt wasn't symmetrical on both sides. So this is weird um, interstride variability that your body naturally has, whether it's to you know, whether it's this noise in your brain or whether you're, you know, just negotiating gravity or, you know, you're affected by external stimulus, stimuli out there. And you see so you step a little differently, like somebody's close to you running beside you and you, you just change your step a little bit. So that variability, I think, is important. And if you're on a motorized treadmill, it's set to go whatever you set it at 15 miles per hour. And that's consistent. Whereas on the manual treadmills, it kind of conforms a little more to your variability, right? Like I was listening to this great um, YouTube video and they were talking about drumming. And I think they were talking about the Led Zeppelin drummer Bonham, John Bonham. And, and they would notice that when they, he was not necessarily on time. Like if you put a metronome next to him, but his variability in the tempo actually made the song or made his rhythm as opposed to because i think they mechanically dissected his drumming and then they made it so it was on time and it sounded not as good as his actual wow. drumming right so it's, it's pretty cool that there's from a human level or an organism level that it's nice to have some sort of variability within that rhythm and that's i think what we gravitate towards as human beings whereas we're not robotic you know hitting every stride so that's why i like Long story short, Anthony, that's why I like <laughs> these curved manual treadmills because it kind of conforms to somebody's natural stride and gait. And obviously you can make some improvements, but I just find it's a nice way to video somebody from the side, give them some cues. We work on these mechanics and it's easier than if we did it at the track where I have to run beside them or, you know, it's harder to film them that way. So you do get some transfer from achieving some technical qualities on the treadmill and then taking them on to the track. So. Yeah, that's my opinion. All right. Um, you know what? Let's segue that into a little bit of technology. What's the minimum amount of technology that, you know, you would say not that you need, but that would be really good coaches out there. If, if you got this much technology, this kind of camera, maybe or, you know, this is what the, the minimum would be would be great. Yeah, I, I, it's going to really come back to like at first I would have like, you know, 10 years ago, I would say get a good stopwatch where you can store times in it. You can keep track of, you know, the times that people run. And um, and that's what Charlie Francis would have said. But, you know, we have these phones that can shoot 
amazing video now and I'm trying to upgrade my iPhone to a higher level, but they're really expensive. <laughs> and uh, so you have the, the iPhone uh, X series and then you have these uh, Huawei, which apparently it's a much better camera. Video camera, I think Hawk and Anderson uh, put up uh, a Huawei video at 960 frames per second of somebody doing a med ball start. And it was really impressive. But unfortunately, um, I think Google and President Trump are going to uh, somehow ban Huawei <laughs> for That's security right. reasons, <laughs> and uh, which is unfortunate because I would just want the camera. I don't need to use it as a phone. But I think having a, a good phone where you can store stuff and have you know a decent capacity on that phone, so you can have a whole you know store store all your athletes' information on there, and if you upload it to the cloud, great. But you can shoot it at variable frame rates. So if you can get at least 120 frames per second on a video, you get a lot of information, like your ground contact time will be accurate up to a hundredth of a second, which is great. So you can measure ground contact time, you could measure uh, angles, like it's just a way to capture everything. And if you use Dartfish Express or some other uh, biomechanical software analysis so app, um, you can now have this and you can do before or after, you can show the athlete on the spot like, this is what you look like. This is what I want. And we do this in the certification course. We, we show people how to use their phones properly. Um, so everybody has a phone. Everybody has some video recording capability. I would say, you know, be careful, you know, make sure you have the specs to support this 120 frames per second. Um, and then just, just go with it. Just collect. That's your data collection device. Uh, in essence. And I, I don't know if anything else is needed beyond that from a technology point of view. I'm interested in things like stride frequency. So I've kind of put it out there to some wearable companies. Like, can you give me real time stride frequency so I can measure it during performances, runs, uh, rehab? Um, and I'm still waiting back. I don't think they've, they've, they have it to that point where you can get accurate real time stride frequency. So I can see it on my phone while somebody's on one of these treadmills, that would be pretty cool. So, but otherwise get a good phone. That's, that's, yeah. that's what I'm learning right now. Nice. And they have to be able to mark it up a little bit, right? Cause they want to be the hashtag. Could you explain to everybody what be the hashtag is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like I, I think I was, I was, uh, I was doing something at drive in New York and Chris Wykus and I were like looking at the angles on the phone. He says, ah, that looks kind of like a hashtag. And we sort of laughed. And, and then I said, well, I guess that's something people can relate to. Like you can draw a hashtag to match like, you know, whatever the, the extension of the back leg. And then you have the knee coming out at 90 degrees. And then the shin angle is parallel with the, the extension leg or the stance leg. And so when you draw a superimpose an, a hashtag on somebody, pretty much that's where their limb position should be when they sprint, um, you know, when off a uh, toe off on, uh, the extension leg. So I just, I just found it again, I'm always trying to make things simple and say, like, if I'm working with a kid and I say, look, you got to be the hashtag, they understand that. Or if I said, well, you know, your stance leg and your swing leg have to be here, then I lose them right away. So. Yeah. You'd yeah. lose me right away. So, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, you had an article, in, and we're going to start to segue this as well into the, the the certification because I think this is where you're really differentiating yourself. This is not just for um, for sprinting. I know we've been talking a lot about sprinting so far, but I, I really found this interesting when in in the triathlete ar uh, article, um, they were you were talking about. You have to be fast over short distances to be fast over long distances. It's been proven time in and time out. And uh, by making somebody more efficient at shorter duration activity, they can extrapolate and say, this is where my arms should be. This is where I should be looking. This is where my posture should be. This is how my feet should land. So if you go for a 10 mile run, there's a lot of time, you know, you're, you're putting your brain somewhere else. And by setting that scenario up it's only you know where it's 20 to 30 seconds they have to focus on that technical aspect that's staring them in the face right now can you expand on this this idea and you know that look it's not just for sprinting yeah definitely um you know again you know new york city is kind of the incubator for a lot of my ideas and that's you know that's probably why we we should go out for a beer more when i go to new york city and we yeah. talk about these things but um 
the 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 whole phenomenon of like the fall is approaching and people want to do the New York Marathon, uh, it kind of hit me right in the face because a lot of the personal trainers I was helping said, I have these clients and they want to run a marathon and all they do is they just want to run more. I think there's some certain apps you can get that tell you the, the virtual coach that guide you through your marathon progression. And basically they just keep adding volume on like longer runs more frequently. And what the, the personal trainers were finding is that people were just getting their, their butts kicked by just loading on volume, but there was no uh, information on technique running efficiency, running economy, and just even how to do the progression a little smoother so that people weren't getting hurt. Um, so we started talking about everything from the technique that's involved, uh, doing, you know, very small, smallish plyometrics, low amplitude plyometrics to work on elasticity. And this idea that if I can affect uh, ground contact time positively, if I can make them more elastic and get them off the ground a little quicker, there can be a benefit, whether it's reduced injury, um, just more responsive ground contacts that lead to kind of a higher average velocity. And we did, I said, okay. Uh, and they said, well, they, they don't, don't really understand that. You know, these are like hedge fund managers, CEOs, and they just think more is better. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. okay, well, let's throw the math back in their face. And I said, if you can reduce their ground contact time by one one hundredth of a second, so maybe they're on the ground three tenths of a second. So if you can shave off one one hundredth of a second off each each stride, what does that mean? Well, if if they take sixty thousand strides to run a marathon and you knock off one one hundredth of a second per stride, that's going to be a ten minute improvement. If you can do that with two or three tenths, right? You know, it's twenty minutes, thirty minutes. You can knock thirty minutes off. And I assume that most of these people are pretty sloppy when they hit the ground. So you could probably have a great sort of potential for improvement on just their ground contact. And that's all you have to work on. You don't have to run more. We could just work, you know, in the gym on these things in terms of plyos and technique and drills. So that that became a little more compelling uh, for these trainers in terms of explaining why they're doing what they're doing. Because otherwise, you know, they are just left with one variable to to work with, which is run more. And as you know, if you're if you're trying to get a run in in New York City, um, you know, there's you're basically running on concrete most of the time or asphalt. And that's that's tough. That's really tough. And then we had we also had this discussion. There was this great uh, video uh, where it was in Chicago. I think it was for the Chicago Marathon. And they had a treadmill uh, in the convention center and it was going at the same rate that the world record was for the marathon which is, uh, I think the marathon record's two hours, one minute, and a little bit and change, right? So if you did that, you're running f basically 4.39 per mile, four minutes and 39 seconds per mile. And nobody can really do that. And the you know, average person, average Joe, can run a 4.39 mile once. This guy's doing it 26 times. So in order to do that, 4.39, I kind of did the math and I talked to some people. And basically, you're running a sub four mile, probably, if you're doing that. Uh, so 350 something. And if you're running a 350 something mile, you're probably running a 400 meters in like 46 or 47 seconds, which means your 100 time is probably under 11 seconds. So in order to run a two hour marathon, your 100 times got to be pretty fast as well. So you just have to be fast and you have to be efficient. I don't care what what distance you're covering. You have to train these qualities. And if you don't and you just try to run yourself into shape, uh, it can be very difficult. I love that reverse engineer there. That's pretty fascinating. Under eleven uh, seconds, cool. Yeah, yeah. It's it's and and if you probably were if you and I were standing on the side of the road and one of these guys was running, you know, past us, it would be like zoom, right? You know, yeah. and he's doing that for twenty six plus miles. It's crazy. Um, yeah. Also, in that article, you're talking about uh, like one of the recommendations was was hill sprints. It's funny. You know, I kind of, I you know, maybe just like growing up in a kind of more of a football town, I always think of hill sprints as almost like they were like this punishment thing, right, <laughs> with the football team, right? So, um, and and Dr. Ken Clark was on, and he was talking about some some hills that they've been using to help technique, and uh, he was he was laughing because I asked him, I, I stumped him, I said, what's the uh, what's the uh, percentage uh, grade there on the hill? And he's like, you know, I don't even know that. He's like, I gotta I gotta find that out. Um, talk to us you're about this idea about hill sprints and and how it can help us. Yeah. Um... I just always, even as a kid, like uh, I had some great coaching where if we went 
to find a hill uh, from a track and field perspective, it was to work on something in terms of like strength, like we talked about that before, but also running up a hill, you know, gets you to step over and get, get your, your foot off the ground and in front of you uh, a little better. So it helps with that technique. Um, it just gives you some support too. If you running up a hill uh, and you have that resistance, it, it just, you just have a little more time to kind of focus on the technique. So I'll do that a lot with a lot of my athletes is we'll do the early portions of the training program on the hill and I'll give them technical cues. And I may say, look, we're going to go at about 90% of your output. Um, and they just, they just look more relaxed. Uh, we film it, we show it to them. Um, so there's a lot of things going on. It's not just the resistance piece. There's a technical piece. There's a relaxation piece that I like with the Hills. And we found that, um, the grade, uh, was probably around the same as like whatever the, uh, American disabilities act is for wheelchair ramps. It's not that much like it, it doesn't have to be that much. So I think we did a project for the Minnesota Vikings with Mark Uyama, who's a strength coach there. And we built some ramps and, and grades, uh, for the football team to use as part of their sprint training. And it came out to probably about, I would say seven to 9%, which is about a five degree angle. Um, and, uh, you know, we we messed with sort of the, the profile of the curve. So some of them were linear, uh, angles and some of them were more parabolic where it kind of was a little steeper at the beginning. And then it flattened out as you got further up the hill, just kind of like a regular acceleration curve. So he's been very happy with that. I think they did it with turf so they could just go on there with their cleats and it's not this ominous hill where it's, you know, you know, you're going up and it's very slow and you're, you're stressing your Achilles. And that was a big consideration was if we have 350 pound linemen going up this hill, think of the Achilles stress if that angle is too steep. So there, you know, there are a lot of factors going into it, but it is one of the better ways to work on sprint technique, acceleration technique, let's say not max velocity, but acceleration technique and, um, do it without, like I had one university, they have like, Oh, we have 120 guys. We want to do sled work, pull sleds. I mean, how many sleds you have, like yeah. who's setting that up? You know, what weight do you use for different positions? Like how much weight do you put on it? So it's just, it's really difficult to do it if you have sleds uh, and other equipment, but if you have a nice hill, it makes it a lot easier. How far is the? Did you guys set that up for? Uh, usually about 30, 30 yards, thirty meters, because that's usually the the extent of somebody's acceleration capabilities. Not not much farther. Some of them went a little farther, but most of the workout would be 10, 20, 30 yards, thirty meters. Okay, cool, great. Uh, let's get into this uh, running mechanics. Uh, certification that you have now your first one is going to be in july in new york city at drive 495 right are you able to come and uh, be a guest of that uh, yeah I'm, i might be able to come down for for at least a day so okay uh, yeah. yeah that'd be great i'd love, to, be great. love yeah. to do that yeah. So, um, you know, I've, I've, I have a good history with Don Saladino and drive and, uh, done some in-service work for them and, and they've kind of really uh, taken to it. So I thought, Hey, that's a great place to start it. A lot of the ideas around the private sector I got from just, just working with the, the people at drive and understanding what, what kind of needs there were. Um, you know, and so I, I think it'll be a great event. We're going to try to make it quite, uh, quite a New York experience too. So very cool. I th you know, this is what I liked about it too. I'll be honest with you. Drive 495 is not exactly your, you know, your typical sports performance place. It's not a sports performance place at all. Originally started as a golf place. They do right. have turf there, but there, this is the, you know, I think sometimes people look at Don and under, you know, think, okay, he, he's training all the superheroes and all the celebrities. And it must be this incredible 60, 60,000 square foot place. And it's not, it's a typical kind of New York city place. So I think anybody that's coming here, it's not like you're not going to see any special, uh, running, uh, uh, equipment here. Right. Yeah. I mean, they have one curved treadmill where we can do a few interesting things, but for the most part, yeah, they have space, which is important. And there's a lot of enthusiasm around it. And, uh, it's, it's a unique place in that, you know, some of the clientele there are pretty interesting, yeah. but, um, yeah, I mean the, you know, evolving from a golf facility into sort of this very well-rounded fitness and training facility, it, it, it's a pretty nice place.
Yeah. So tell me about this now. It's not just this level, you know, like a lot of times with certifications, people start off with just, okay, here's our certification. You have three levels. Um, and I'm not sure if it's like Titleist. Titleist will do three levels, but everybody goes to level one and then like medical professionals split off into their level two, the fitness professionals split off into their level two and the golf go into their level two. And you can do either one. You just have to, uh, you know, you, you just have to do your, your uh, credentialed one first. Uh, how is this working with your three levels? Yeah, kind of the same thing where we have a foundational course for level one and and level one is really uh i mean it could be kind of a standalone thing where if you take it you'll you'll leave with a lot of good strategies and knowledge but the whole idea is that level one sets you up for the language and just the sort of the some of the technical concepts so that when we get into the medical or rehab uh, uh stream now, when I talk about stride frequency and uh, vertical force production and ground contact times, now it makes sense to you in a rehab sense. Uh, if if we do, I have a sport one, so it's more for strength and conditioning coaches um, and uh, sports performance people working with you know athletes of any age. Um, same sort of thing. Now we can really transition into those discussions and talk about position specific or sports specific uh, qualities that we're looking for and we use the same language and then we have a fitness one which is personal trainers uh, group fitness people and they might have different goals for their clients than the sport people sometimes it will be performance so somebody wants to run a faster marathon at new york city um, or somebody wants to uh, basically just get fitter and find unique strategies or, or effective strategies for losing weight and, you know, just kind of trimming their waistline. So depending on, you know, and some people might want to do all of those courses. So if you're working a drive and you have fitness clients, you have sport clients and you have to do some rehab or return to play stuff, there's streams that you can take and we get more specific as you go through the ecosystem and, and down the streams. So that's pretty much, I mean, it sounds pretty much, uh, you know, what you're talking about. Is it, is it, um, like with, with the, uh, the, the rehab stuff, can I be a strength coach or fitness professional? Obviously I want to stay in my lane, but, um, can I go, can I still attend those? Is there any requirements? Like for example, SFMA, you can't go unless you're a physical therapist, right? So <laughs> yeah, I mean, I talked, I talked to uh, a lot of people about this, right. And, um, you know, when, I think when you restrict stuff, um, it, it just doesn't help the industry as a whole. So I thought, I talked to Michael Ranfone about it and he thought, and he, he's involved with the FRC stuff. And he thought that, you know, the more inclusive we can make it, the better it's going to be for everybody. So yes, you can come to the re if you're a personal trainer, you can benefit from coming to the med course, the rehab course, because now you can have a conversation with your physical therapist around these concepts who are your, whoever you're referring to. And likewise for the strength coach working with the athletic trainer and, you know, if we if we can, you know, have people talking about the same concepts and they understand why we're going to do sprinting early on in a hamstring rehab case or an ACL case, then it's an easier conversation. But if I just restrict it to only the medical people, then it gets more difficult, in my opinion, to really get everybody on side. So that's that's what we're going to try to do. Obviously, the med course, we want to um, push it towards medical professionals. Um, and, and I've had some requests from purely medical organizations who want to understand how to use this better. Um, so it's it, it'll be interesting to see how, how it shakes out. Yeah, and I, I think Titleist did a great job, again, with this in terms of saying, okay, you're a fitness professional, but we do want you to attend. You know, in in level one, they talk about medical stuff. They talk about yeah. golf stuff. We talk about the 12 swing faults, right? Because we want that language. We want to speak coach. We want to be able to have a golf professional come into our facility and say, hey, you know, my guy is uh, coming over the top, and then he seems to have a chicken wing. You know, do you think you can help him? And, you know, you want to be able to talk to that guy and understand where it's going from. The only danger with that is um, – that I think in Titleist, what I've seen is golf bros go in there and then all of a sudden, you know, you see at the country club, now they think they're TPI certified so they can do a fitness class. So they do a fitness class because it's at the country club. But, you know, I'm not, I don't think you're going to have to worry about that within, you know, in this program, but, um, you know, people kind of crossing over too much. But, uh, but I think, 
you know, having that foundation and then kind of splitting off and getting into a little bit more specific is is always good. Because I think, like you said, we talked about this earlier, it's not just for just sprinting. That's how we know Derek Hansen. We know him as, you know, sprint coach. So we're, you know, there's, it's more to it than that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, I'm very careful not to talk about things like soft tissue techniques or manipulation. Yeah. And, and I'm sure that's where people can get into some, uh, you know, sticky situations. So, but uh, honestly, the same techniques that the personal trainer or the sports performance professional use are going to be part of the medical one. It's just, it's just referenced a little differently or the context is a little different or the progressions might be a little slower. Um, but you know, everybody should be able to understand how to use it if you're working with somebody who's come off a, a plantar fasciitis or Achilles surgery. And, and But I, I just think, you know, like we talked about before, having everybody introduced to this, um, then it just makes it easier for practitioners to work in an interdisciplinary approach. So Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the first course is July 20th. And 21st um, at Drive 495, and it's uh, level one foundations and level two medical. Um, so the price starts where you can get one day, and then you can just get the level one and not go to level two, or could, is it a two day thing? Yeah, if you just want to come get level one and you want to do something exciting on your Sunday or your weekend, you want to actually have a weekend, you <laughs> can come for one day. And I think that was the big thing was that we will offer these in one day courses as well because i understand everybody's busy especially um in new york city where people want to get out of the city for the weekend yeah. and, and actually have some fun uh, so yeah uh, or we we bundle them too so that you can save some money and get two of them done in one weekend so we're giving that option and if you register early you get a, a discount as well so very cool and then your second one will be in montreal in august and uh, we're going to have links to that so uh very cool Derek. excited about this looking forward to coming down on uh on, on july 20th to drive 495 and checking out the foundations course so thank you so much for coming on going over some of this uh these uh old sprint topics that i know i've asked you about before but uh, we appreciate you updating us on that and talking about the uh running mechanics professional certification yeah well thanks for having me on anthony and i, I look forward to actually having you there and, and getting your feedback as well All right, that's going to do it for episode 256 of the Strength Coach Podcast. Remember, you can try strengthcoach.com out three days just to buck you have access to all the articles, videos, and programs, as well as the best forum on the net. It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every day. To access that offer, go to strengthcoach.com, click the Join Now button to get started on your trial. Special thanks to Chris Parr and the folks over at Perform Better. Right now, the Spend More, Save More sale is going on. Also, don't forget special financing, 0% interest for 36 months, no down payment, and no payment for six months. Summit season is here. Orlando is this week. Then we got Chicago, Long Beach, and Providence. I'll be speaking there. Make sure you come by and say hi. You can check it all out at performbetter.com. Thanks to Coach Boyle and Derek Hansen for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength and conditioning, performance enhancement, and speed. Thanks to Adam Doughty, Tim Robinson, and Train Heroic. Head over to trainheroic.com to start your free 14-day trial. Let them know I sent you. You'll save 10% off your first year of the Elite or Pro Edition. Rachel Cosgrove for the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. Check them out at resultsfitnessuniversity.com. Jenna Gourlay and the Functional Movement Systems. Check them out at functionalmovement.com. My name's Anthony Renna. Go to continuefit.com. For all the past podcasts, you can also get us on iTunes or Spotify. Thanks again, and I'll speak to you next time.